Hey, how are you? I'm going to adjust this light here a little bit. Thank you so much for uh, joining me here. We are live from Las Vegas. I hope you're doing well. Gosh, that is super bright. I'm going to scoot over a little bit there. How's that? That's better? Yeah? All right. So, uh, so basically, here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to talk about how to hustle strategically. Uh, not long ago, hey, Doug, how's it going, man? Uh, there is a fallacy, like, you know, you got to hustle, 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 hustle all the time. And that's not always a good idea. There are ways to get a lot done uh, without having a detriment uh, to your health or whatever. Iron Man, that's right, Joseph. <laughs> that was a long time ago I did the Iron Man. So basically, here's what happened, you guys. And, and so this is the takeaway. You're going to learn how to become more productive without burning yourself out and, uh, and also get more out of life and, and, and hopefully have a lot more fun in the process as well. So, um, hey, Carlos, you're welcome. You guys ask questions. Uh, get ready to ask the questions because I'm going to answer all of your questions. So there's a gentleman who uh, I follow on social media as well, and I've read his books. His name's Michael Hyatt, and he's, just, he's a brilliant guy. And I just actually saw, and I've said this before, but I, I have a different name for it than he does it. I call it strategic hustle or, or hustling strategically. And he called it the hustle fallacy. And he said, the, the hustle fallacy leads to lack of self-care. And I thought that was really a, a good way uh, of, of uh, illustrating that. Because, I mean, I, I think what happens is everyone sees, you know, someone like Gary Vaynerchuk. And, uh, you know, he's making $100 million a year at plus or whatever it is. And uh, he's going, 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 and he's on stage, he's making a bunch of money, and he's, he's influential and all this kind of stuff. And then people say, yeah, I'm going to grind like Gary V. Uh, but if you look at Gary, I mean, he's a nice guy, but does, he kind of looks older than his years. <laughs> and some of that is genetics, but some of it is just beating the hell out of your body and your mind and not getting adequate sleep and all that kind of stuff. So we're actually going to talk about how to hustle strategically, how to hustle intelligently, and avoid self-care neglect, optimize self-care along the way, and then do what I call strategic hustling. Strategic hustling is a work-rest cycle. Just like if, you know, I have a lot of people that watch this that are, are exercise physiologists, trainers, things like that. And in exercise, and when you're, you're doing what's called program design, you do what's called a work-rest cycle. A work-rest cycle is, you know, uh, 30 seconds on, 10 seconds off, or two minutes on, 30 seconds off. Or you're going to, for every 12 reps, you're going to do a minute off. Or as, as you go heavier, oftentimes you'll rest more. That's not always the case, but often the case. But that's a work-rest cycle. That is a strategic hustle. Can you imagine trying to do a maximum deadlift, bench press, uh, snatch, clean and jerk, something like that? Every 30 seconds. You're going for a maximum effort every 30 seconds. That would be stupid. And you wouldn't do very well. So the bigger the effort, and this, this is for exercise and in life. This, actually, I just thought about that for the first time. That's pretty cool. They are paralleled. So the bigger the effort in exercise, the more the rest period is needed. The bigger the effort in something in life, the more the rest and recovery period is needed. And what happens is people get really wound up doing you know, they, they, they make progress and then they go, okay, I'm going to go, 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 go. And you keep going. That's okay to an extent, but then you literally get to the point and you go, man, I'm exhausted or I don't feel good. Um, I was just at a trade show yesterday at the, uh, at Mandalay and, uh, it was for the hospitality industry and everyone had been going out and partying here in Vegas every night, uh, which is typical, right? Um, and, it is true and profound, huh, A.V.? I agree. Um, they, these people were zombies. They literally couldn't think right. And what's crazy is these people would spend, and I'm not exaggerating, up to $100,000 plus to build out their booth for essentially a two-and-a-half-day trade show. And they were so exhausted from partying that they couldn't even facilitate a sale or do an explanation because they were so exhausted because they continued to hustle. So there has to be a work-rest cycle. So what is that for you? And here's the thing, too, is that everyone is different. Simply because Gary Vaynerchuk uh, can keep going, going, going. You know what? I, at this rate, knowing his physiology, and I bet if you looked at his, his blood profile and his hormone profile, I bet he has a ton of cortisol, 
Um, I bet his lipid profile is a problem. I'm just, I'm just hypothesizing, by the way. I haven't looked at Gary Vaynerchuk's uh, blood work. <laughs> but you can't keep doing that, okay? And, and, and I've done that to myself as well. When I was training for different sports competitions, and I would go, 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 and I would get sick. And also, every time before, or actually right at, well, actually, no, during and right after a launch, like a product launch, I would get sick. I would get like flu-like symptoms after I did a launch. And as a lot of you know, I just launched not long ago, Online Expert Empire. And, uh, b but what I did, because I learned from the past, is I cranked super hard. I worked really, really hard. But then I took some partial days off, or I eased up my workouts that last week, or I spent an extra 10 minutes in the jacuzzi, or I made sure I drank extra water, or I had a small cocktail instead of a large cocktail. I mean, seriously, little things like that all add up because it has to, there has to be an equilibrium. There has to be a balance. So uh, as an example, you know, I worked super hard for several months to launch that product, Online Expert Empire. For the last three days, I only worked about three hours a day. And it felt really, really good. And now today, I feel recharged. And I feel like I'm able to, uh, to do more. Although it's the weekend, right? I actually lose track of <laughs> what day it is. But it's the weekend. So I also need to uh, enjoy myself as well. I'm going to the Cher concert tonight. Uh, I know I may lose my man card, but I'm going to go see Cher. Uh, I got some tickets, so I'm going to go see Cher. I know. I know. So, hey, my buddies, I see Cree is watching. Don't laugh. All right. Um, so here's what I'd like for you to do. Think about what you can do to create the proper work rest cycle to where you can maximize your effort, but also maximize your recovery. And often, and here's the other thing too, your recovery needs to be strategic, just like your hustle is strategic. So as an example, I'm just giving you, sharing this, you know, what I do, and if it works for you, that's fantastic. By the way, you guys can ask questions anytime you want. So what I do is like, um, today's Saturday, so I, I got a new computer. Some of you guys saw my post. I got a new computer set up in my office, and, um, and so I spent about an hour kind of dialing that in, and then I worked for a couple hours. Do I, wait a minute, do you believe in life after death? Is that what someone, someone just said? Wait, wait, oh, wait a minute, wait. Yeah, Cher is awesome, especially in fitness, fishnet stockings. She's 72, dude. She's 72 years old. Uh, pretty, pretty great. I know, like, she's a heck of a production, but for 72, I'm sure it's still a heck of a show. Uh, it will be something you have to see Cher at some point if you're in Vegas, right? You just got to do it. That's one of the things. So what I was saying is, uh, don't, don't mess me up. Uh, I am not going to sing a Cher song, uh, Trisha. That is, there's no way in hell that's going to happen. Um, <laughs> no, I will not do that. Actually, I only know like a couple, so it's going to be really interesting. Let me get back to this. Uh, okay, so when I worked out, like I'm recovering today because I had a couple really hard days of training this week. And so today was easy. So I took the dogs for like a mile and a half walk. And it's not fast with the dogs. So that's recovery. It's active recovery. Uh, and, uh, and while I walked the dogs, I listened to educational podcasts. But something that's enjoyable and not too intense because this is an active recovery day. I don't want to listen to something too intense that's going to fry my brain. Um, and then I did uh, easy spin bike at the gym. And then I did like two basic uh, weight training movements. And I did the vibratory plate to kind of loosen up my back. I, I, I did it at the end. I should have also done it at the beginning. Uh, and then I did the jacuzzi and the steam, which is going to dehydrate me further with everything. It's going to be like 100 degrees here today as well. So how do I balance that? for my strategic recovery to go with my strategic hustle. I drink water before, during, and after. And I hydrate even more afterwards. Then I come back upstairs and I have liquid vitamins with phytonutrients, liquid collagen and bone broth, and liquid aminos. And, uh, and then I also had like a, a banana. Because I, after I deplete, I want to bring things back up to you know, a, a good operational level. It's because that allows me to, uh, I mean, I literally think of it like, you know, you know like when you take your, your, um, your car in, think of it like this. When you take your car in, and maybe you go to the dealership, and maybe you just go to one of those, like, Jiffy Lube or someplace like that, right? Either, either way, whatever your, your flavor is. But they go and they top off all the levels. They check your, the, the filters. Um, they uh, top off the, the air in your tires. They make sure that your oil is, is good and the, um, 
maybe the uh, coolant for your, your air conditioning unit and uh, when the radiator fluid, all that kind of stuff, engine coolant. You, when you go in for a repair like that in your car, you top off everything, and then you can tell the difference, too, when you get into it. You're like, wow, I mean, just a little bit. Everything's just a tiny bit better. That's the way I want you to approach the things that you do in your life and in your body as well with your strategic hustle. Right now, I'm talking about the strategic recovery, right? But there has to be both. There has to be a strategic hustle and a strategic recovery. So we'll get to the hustle in just a second. But the recovery is even more important because especially quality sleep, and we're going to get to some sleep strategies here in a second. But you, when you, have you heard someone say, I need, to, I need to, a good sleep on that, or I'll, I'll sleep on it, and, and then you have clarity, or whatever it is? Um, there's a lot of scientific evidence to suggest that the learning really doesn't take place until you sleep the night after you learn something, the, the night after you do something profound the night after you do maybe some uh, exceptional training. Uh, the thing that really brought this to light for me it was uh, working with my Muay Thai coach and learning this, you know, this type of kickboxing, if you're familiar with it. He says, you've already done the work. Relax. Now go sleep. And I had to think about it. I'm like, I want to keep going and keep going and keep going because I had more left. He goes, no, you're good. Now just process it. Get a good night's sleep. And then when we come back, you know, two days later, it's, you're better. In this, but if I got a poor night's sleep after hustling like that, then it doesn't get transferred into the subconscious or the, or the long-term memory as well. But also your brain can't process the information and utilize the information and also uh, strengthen that neural connection uh, through and, and then also enhance what's called the myelin sheath which is the f uh, fiber that covers the nerves that goes from your brain to your, the, the various muscles uh, to enhance that neurological signal. So you need to get quality sleep after you do that hustle. It doesn't matter if it's physical, mental, emotional, uh, educational, um, with, for your business, your relationship, whatever it is. Having a good night's recovery afterwards is very, very important. Hey, Peter Sorensen, you guys need to come over here so we can do uh, a training. So we got to plan that out. So make sure you reach out to me. Um, so before we, again, before we get to the actual strategic hustle part, I want to talk about rest, recovery, and sleep. Is that, that looks like that's super bright. I'm going to change the angle of this here a little bit. Hang on a second. Is that, is that better? On my way over later. All right. You know, I'm going to the share concert, man. I know you can make fun of me, but I'm going to the share concert tonight, but we'll get together soon. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Here, gosh darn it. This thing is, there's so much. Hang on a second. Let me, let me move this. Look at that. Is that better? Is that a little better? Okay, cool. Um, so sleep is Im imperative to your hustle. Because if you don't sleep, then all that you did and all that you learned in your strategic hustle uh, doesn't get transferred to the long-term memory. And you also are more susceptible to... Um, stress hormones and lack of recovery and uh, e even the lack of quality deep restorative sleep is the single biggest thing you can do to reduce your likelihood of cancer and Alzheimer's and all types of uh, different cognitive decline issues and uh, immune dysfunctions and all sorts of things like that. It all has to do with the recovery. Everyone's worried about the hustle all the time. I'm worried about the recovery, especially since I've gotten older. You guys know my next birthday is 50. Woo, gonna be 50, baby. And the way I'm able to do the things I do physically and all the martial arts and all the training and stay in great shape and run all these companies is because I do a ratio of one to one. I do a ratio of one to one. So what does that mean? That means for every time I decide to go out and with my friends and have a cocktail, I know that I'm gonna, and I don't have 10, that's for damn sure, but if I have one, you know, I think, okay, well, I'm going to drink water before, and I'm going to drink water after. And then I need to have milk thistle, because that helps my liver function. And then the next day, I'm not going to do it. But it's a balance. I can go have fun, but then I just go, okay, well, how do I balance that out so I have good recovery, and I'm not doing my body a big disservice, but I can still go enjoy myself. Um, when I go do a super hard workout, I know that I'm going to either go to the chiropractor, go get a massage, sit in the steam, sauna, jacuzzi bathtub, whatever it is. Um, and I know that, well, now I don't, I don't eat any 
any bad food because I had to change my diet. You guys have been following me. You know, I don't. I, I had to totally change my diet because I had a bunch of food allergies and inflammatory processes. And those of you who have seen me for a while, I would be willing to bet that you think that I look healthier. Hope so, because I definitely am a lot healthier and a lot happier since I, I got um, my diet all squared away. So I appreciate all of you who have given me insight. Truly. So let's talk about the recovery. The sleep now. Okay, write these things down because this is important. A lot of people focus on the hustle. We're going to get there. We've got to talk about the sleep now because the sleep preceding and following the hustle is what matters and it's what allows you to hustle more intelligently. When you go to sleep, you don't just go to sleep. That's a fallacy because we like you, you go to the store, you might go to the bathroom, <laughs> but you don't just go to sleep. If you go to bed and you go bam and you're out, you're overtired. There's something wrong. You, you have done too much, maybe too much hustle. It should take a few minutes to transcend from the day and embrace the night. And, and you can't do too... You, if you fall asleep too fast, there's something wrong. Your body is overtired, and that's a signal unto itself, okay? So how do you prepare for a good night's sleep? There's a, you, you need rituals, just like anything else that you do in life. Think about anything that you're really, really, really good at in life. Anything. Think about it. You have a ritual. You have a ritual for success. You have a ritual for preparation. You have a ritual during. You have a ritual following. The same is true for sleep, but people don't think about it. You know why? Because you're sleeping. But you need to. It's, it's imperative. All right? So here's what you do. About two hours before you go to sleep, dim the lights in the house. What happens is, especially here in Las Vegas, it's crazy. I'm looking out at the strip right here. At night, we have uh, blinds that come down around this, this whole thing here because it's just too much. You have to let go of the day and embrace the night. But if you don't dim the lights, your brain doesn't detect the onset of darkness through the lens of your eyes, which is de truly detected by the pineal gland. Some people would call that the third eye. Um, and then it doesn't secrete enough melatonin and growth hormone and testosterone later in, in night as well. And then you can't recover. Those are the things that help you recover. Um, so what happens is the, the, the world is artificially inflated and inflamed, I should say, with light. Um, when you go camping, as an example, if you were to go camping or go outside, have you noticed that you don't have a hard time going to sleep. It's just a little campfire or whatever it is. I know some of you are like, I don't camp, but when you did, right? When you have too much light, it makes it difficult to sleep. That's also why it's more difficult to sleep in the summer, in the northern hemisphere anyway, opposite in the southern hemisphere, because it stays light longer, and so it takes longer for, your, for the darkness to have the onset of darkness, and then it takes longer for the whole secretion of hormones and everything to cascade and, and for that to happen. Also, there, it stays warmer in the summer, at least in the northern hemisphere, opposite, obviously, in the southern hemisphere, and your brain needs to cool at night. And so it needs to cool about 2 degrees uh, Fahrenheit at night. So if you don't have a cool room, it also makes it more difficult to sleep. So dim the lights in your house two hours before bed. Stay away from uh, bright lights and things like that as well. And even talking on your cell phone and electronics and things like that. And I know it's fun to watch a movie in bed and things like that. And, and, uh, but your bedroom's for two things, and one of them's sleeping. Okay? And you need, to, you need to let go of all the electronics and just chill out, and you will do better. You will feel better, and you will have better results when you have to hustle. So two hours before bed, dim the lights. Uh, stay away from electronics. And don't exercise. The only, thing you, the only exercise is, that's good before bed is, is sex and gentle yoga. Uh, honestly, that's about it. Uh, and, and nothing else, because it's too stimulating, and it raises your core temperature, uh, and then it makes it too difficult to transcend again and relax um, to where you can, you can get to those deep restorative levels of sleep. Um, so, so what's the proper amount of uh, temperature? It's about 65 to 67 percent humidity and 65 to 67 degrees Fahrenheit is ideal for quality sleep. Okay, um, and everyone's a little bit different. And by the way, we, we're going to talk about the hustle in a second. We'll get there, but we got to talk about how you recover so you can hustle better, right? It's got to be preemptive.
we need the preemptive part of it. So um, another thing you can do for a ritual before you go to bed is some people will read, some people pray, some people meditate, some people will maybe go for a very gentle walk, but you don't want it too stimulating, right? And, and also, the last thing you watch before you go to bed should not be like some murder show or definitely not Fox News or CNN. Holy crap, no, do not do that, either of them, none of them, no news, no news. I've been watching the news for two years and I love it. Don't fill your mind with that crap, You're, don't be programmed. And it also makes you think about stuff and worry about stuff that you literally have no control over. So don't, don't do that. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your effort. Don't play their game. Don't be indoctrinated. Don't be programmed. Don't do it. Just create your own ritual for success when you go to bed. So pray, meditate, take a bath. Oh, here's something too. This is really interesting. Have you ever noticed how you sleep really well after you take a hot bath? Have you ever wondered why that is? You're like, if I'm, if I'm, and like, you're like, well, John just said we have to cool our, our core temperature about two degrees Fahrenheit to get optimal sleep because our brain needs to cool itself during nighttime. Well, that's true. So why taking a hot bath would allow you to sleep better? It seems counterintuitive, right? This is some simple science, but something really cool. So when you take a hot bath, when you, when you look, your skin's red, right? It's, it's because there's more blood to the surface. And what happens is you get out of that hot bath into the cooler air, and then the heat from your body that was deep inside the core escapes through convection through your skin into the air, and then the rest of your body is cooler. So it's a cooling method. It's a way to cool your core temperature by taking a hot bath because then all the heat escapes your body when you get out. Pretty cool, right? It's so simple. It's, so, it's such a simple thing. So doing that can also help. Um, and then some people like um, a, an, an, uh, what am I trying to say? Not an ambient sound. It's a, well, I guess it is an ambient sound. There's different, probably different ways to describe it. But something that is soothing that will allow you to transcend into the deeper levels of sleep. And there's different apps and things like that as well. Uh, and, and then also, once you wake up, you don't want to wake up to something abrupt. What is your alarm? Tell me. I mean, you probably, you know, like right now, I'm, I'm recording or doing this live video on my iPhone. And my alarm is on my iPhone. Do you think I have one that goes, eh, 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 when I wake up in the morning? Hell no. That would be obnoxious. So remember, you want to transcend easy into the day, or I'm sorry, into the night. Let go of the day, embrace the night. Easy, gentle, have your rituals. And then have your room darker and cooler. And then when you come out of your sleep, you also want that very gentle. Because if it's too abrupt, then it's also disruptive. And think about this. This is, this is a really simple way of thinking why that's not a pleasant thing. Back in the day, if you guys are old enough to remember, when we had alarm clocks or clock radios... And, and you had a song, or a, yeah, a song playing, and that white noise, yes, like waves, yes, that's what I was thinking of, A.B., white noise, holy cow, thank you. Um, yeah, like waves crashing, stuff like that. You can program, there's a bunch of free apps like that, you guys, uh, with white noise and different things like that, that will allow you to um, sleep more easily. When you wake up, you want to wake up gently, because, okay, so going back to when there was clock radios, and you listen to that song, what happened when, you, when that song came on and that was your alarm? What, what, what do you remember? You sang that song all day, right? Because your mind was about as fresh and open and clear and clean as it's going to be the entire day when you first wake up. So that song that you first heard is your first impression of the day. And so because there's nothing else to clutter it, it's what allowed you to carry that song throughout the day. You go, oh my gosh, I can't get this song out of my head because it was the one I listened to when I woke up in the morning. So are, are you waking up to a crazy buzzing sound? I, you know, so that now the whole time when you wake up, eh, 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 and that's what you're listening to when you, when you wake up, and that's the noise and the aggravation and the frustration you'll carry forward all day. Why would you ever do that? It, 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 wait, have you, ever, have you ever broke this down and thought about it like this? It really doesn't make sense. So we talked about rituals, behaviors, and environment to increase uh, sleep quality and sleep depth. We talked about the environment during sleep. We also talked about now getting up and embracing the day. 
All right, so this is how you do strategic hustle. You can't just hustle all the time. It has to be an ebb and flow, a give and take, a yin and yang, right? But how many other comparisons can we come up with? It's critical, it's critical that you do this because the people who don't are the ones that are 30 and look 50 and they're the ones that are 50 that look 80. And you're like, holy crap, they got hit by a truck. No, it's because they grinded all the time and they didn't take care of themselves and they thought more is better all the time. More of some things is good, but you still need a balance. You still need a balance and you have to have this ritualistic behavior and the cognitive awareness to understand how to ebb and flow and get feedback from your body. If you are not turning inward and asking yourself for wisdom, you're crazy and you're really missing out. Much of what you need, if not all of it, is already inside of you. But what happens is we always seek information outward and it's okay to gather information. You're gathering information right now. But once you have that knowledge, or, and a lot of the, inher- the, the wisdom is inherent as well, but what happens is we feel compelled to meet a societal norm, and so we ignore interwisdom to go in pursuit of something uh, that may not be ultimately fulfilling, or a- in pursuit of it, which can be fulfilling, we ignore our self-care because we fall into that hustle fallacy that Michael Hyatt calls it, where we have to go, 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 go all the time because I need to impress people all the time. It's important to relax and enjoy the moment. You know, uh, last night uh, I went and got a a 90-minute massage. It was awesome. And um, you need to treat yourself to things like that once in a while. Uh, Whatever it is, you know, like, are are, are you taking time to nurture after you break yourself down mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, whatever it is, right? Or, or, or D, E, what was it? All the above. You have, to, you have to rebuild. And if you don't, then the foundation, which is necessary for your growth, dissipates. And you're not able to do everything you want to do. And you can't keep building upon the foundation which is how you escalate into doing greater and greater things throughout your life, if you keep demolishing the foundation. And it's also, it's not, just, it's not just the things that we're doing. Think of it like this. Um, it's not just the act of doing something restorative so you can hustle better. It's how you feel about the process while you're doing it. Let me repeat that, because this is, this is the, the key, really. It's not just how you feel that, that you're doing it. Oh, I'm getting a massage or uh, I'm sitting in the jacuzzi or I'm going to uh, do 10 minutes in the steam room or I'm going to go exercise because that's part of my health maintenance program, whatever it is. How do you feel about it while you're doing it? Because that emotional attachment to it will create neuroassociative conditioning with that, but it's also what you think and do and believe during the act which will change the hormones and the neural connections associated with that and which will change the benefit of those activities as well. So an exa- a really simple example is uh, when someone says, um, I exercise for a mental uh, break or a stress relief. There is truth to that, that that can happen. There's no question. But there's a difference between having a mental or emotional benefit from an exercise and doing mindfulness exercise. You get it? Because if you think about it like this, like if I'm just exercising and stretching and I'm doing, you know, whatever, I'm doing like a side bend, right? Or while I'm doing that and I'm doing a yoga posture, I'm thinking, what is the energy coming out of my hands? And how am I creating this line of energy? And how am I breathing? And how do I feel during that time? And do I feel powerful and relaxed at the same time while I'm doing it? And what message is that sending to my body? Because when you do all those things mindfully, it will change the way your body responds. It will change your awareness of yourself at that moment and in the future. And it will also change the long-term benefits of doing those actual activities. And when you tune into those things, uh, you get a much better, profound experience, which will make you more well-recovered and also have greater self-awareness 
uh, and self-efficacy as well. Self-efficacy is that strong belief in yourself that you can do something. And this is a quick sidebar. But by doing all these things, it, it does increase your self-efficacy. So self-efficacy is no matter what, you know that you have what it takes or you can get what it takes or you have the ability to learn what it takes or you will get the resources of what it takes. But it's that strong belief in yourself that anything is possible. Uh, it's not a false belief. It's an appropriate belief that needs to be nurtured over time. And what happens a lot, of, and this is what I have found so, so often. Who was I just listening to? So, someone who trains and coaches some of the top performers in the world. In the world. I forget who it was. Maybe it was Ed Milet. I can't remember. It was him or someone else. But they, they were talking about, you know, when you're working with all these world-class people, uh, and this happens for every person I've ever worked with, too. If it, guys in the UFC, uh, multi-million dollar business owners, uh, people changing the world. It always boils down to, oh, I'm glad you like it. Annette, I don't have my glasses on because it will get all reflection in the light there. Annette, thank you. I am agreeing with you 100%. So true. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate your feedback. It's, it's lack of self-efficacy that will hold you back in everything that you want to do. Yes, Bob Griffin's hashtag mindset matters. Mindset is a very general term. But, oh, and let me, what does AB say? Que question, coach, can intense exercise like CrossFit be considered mindful movements uh, or, uh, or something, uh, or, or to some? Um, yes, but here's the thing, AB, and that's a great question. Because a lot of people like CrossFit, and obviously people can get ridiculously strong and very fit. As long as you have a good coach, you don't hurt yourself. Because a lot of people just go, go too much, do too much. And I know you have a good coach. Um, the only thing about doing something super intense like CrossFit or even like intense sparring in martial arts or something really, really intense, does it help your mental toughness? 100%, because you have to be there mentally. But mindfulness in general, and I'm generalizing, is something that's done slower. It's like, like Tai Chi, yoga, Qigong, uh, moving meditation, contemplative, stuff like that. Muhammad, how are you, sir? Thank you for joining us. So in super, super intense martial arts or CrossFit or powerlifting or things like that, improve mental toughness. But I wouldn't classify it the same way as mindfulness training because you have to go slow enough to unravel the mystery of what your brain is trying to discover. Does that make sense? So when you do something super fast and you're trying to do like a clean, you're like, ah, and then you press, boom, you're going super hard. It's mental toughness because you're going, yes, I got it, right? That's different. That's mental toughness and physical toughness and overall body strength. That's great. Mindfulness is how do I feel? How do I move? How am I breathing? How is everything in, in sync? It's kind of like if you were to walk really slow. And, and that's why, you know, mindfulness training isn't always going to get you in the best shape physically, but it's more important emotionally and mentally. So when you combine them together, you get a, a better benefit, right? Uh, so, so what I would, so think of it like this. If you walk really slow, uh, in the sand at the beach, and you're just like, and you can feel the sand between your toes. Uh, I actually encourage everyone, at least just once, to do a qigong class, a tai chi class, and um, some type of moving meditation or some type of facilitated work like Feldenkrais or something like that. I think you'd have a huge benefit and it'd open your eyes to so much. And then what happens is when you have that mindfulness and then it's time to hustle. You're so aware of everything. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, you guys know I, I do a lot of different martial arts. I've studied uh, eight different martial arts. I have belts in six different martial arts. Uh, but the first one that I fell in love with was Kung Fu, and I did that for 12 years. And I just started studying Kung Fu again with a, a master. And it reminds me of when, when I do it, it's... Uh, it's almost like when, you, when you're done with it, especially when you're doing these slow motion drills and things like that with a partner, it's like, do you remember the Matrix, the original Matrix, and they're dodging bullets and stuff like that, and you just feel like, you, that, I mean, obviously that's an embellishment. But that's the way it feels because your proprioception, your uh, neurological uh, awareness and acuity and everything just peaks, right? 
And, and, but you can't do that if you go too fast. Your reaction time may be faster, but how you understand things and how you are more easily to, able to get out of the way or of, of, of things, you know, I mean that uh, symbolically or, you know, from a parable perspective and, and also physically as well is enhanced. Chris, I'm going to get your question in one second. Let me see what A.V. say. To unravel the mystery your brain is trying to discover. Yes, because if you go too fast, you can't discover the mystery because you move right past it. And also, think, okay, Chris, I'm going to get to your question. Um, I, A.V., I'm going to explain this from a evolutionary neurobiology perspective. I'm going to get nerdy here with you guys for a minute, but I love this stuff. So as we evolved, um, the, the prefrontal cortex of our brain was the last to evolve. It was the, it was the brain stem and, and, the, and the, the base of the brain, and which is for more primary functions and things like that. And that's also why they don't allow you to hit someone in the back of the head in martial arts like that, is because it can kill you because of the primary functions like breathing, uh, you know, uh, heart rate and stuff like that. That's, all, that's why you can't punch someone in the back of the head in a martial arts competition if you ever wondered that, because that's the primary part of the brain. Over millennia, the, the prefrontal cortex of our brain developed last. It is, uh, it is what allows us to pause and make critical decisions, right? And, and analyze facial expressions and all that kind of stuff. But when you react to something, you bypass the prefrontal cortex and use more of the primitive brain. But when you slow down, like I was just talking about, Qigong, Tai Chi, movement therapy, Feldenkrais, Heller work, uh, different body ways like that, you have to slow down to figure things out so you're responding through interpretation and understanding rather than bypassing this and just reacting using the primitive brain. And so when you further develop the prefrontal cortex, you're better able to build relationships, have empathy, um, understand things at a completely different level. Um, but that's why you, you can't develop the best mindfulness with things that move too fast because you're like, it's primitive. It's like, ah, right? Then you're just, you're just doing it. And then it's, it's instinctual. It's primal. And you use, you use the primal portion of your brain. Slow down. Use a prefrontal cortex. And this goes for anything in life. So you want to respond, not react. You only want to react if it's life or death. And that's why it's primitive because uh, basic survival is one of our primary instincts as humans, uh, above anything else, is perpetuation of the species and survival. And that's why it takes place at, at the brain stem and the primitive uh, portion of the brain. And that's also why uh, people, this is, this is crazy too, think, think about the correlation here. Um, unfortunately, uh, people with autism uh, have a, a diminished uh, prefrontal cortex, and that's why they're not able to connect with people and make those critical decisions and have relationships the same way, and, uh, and they're more reactionary. Um, and the same is true, unfortunately, almost identical for people who are sociopathic. Isn't that crazy? So people who are, ha uh, have autism spectrum disorder, uh, regardless of their level of functioning, if it's uh, Asperger's or whatever, the, the prefrontal cortex is not as developed. The same with people who are sociopathic. And we also bypass that part of the brain when we react too quickly and not respond. When we respond, when we use the prefrontal cortex, we also make better decisions, more critical thinking, uh, better relationships. We're, we're better able to understand people's facial expressions as well. And that, that allows us to interpret that information so we can build better relationships. This is also why guys who've been fighting a long time and they get over time, one of the things they have a hard time with is relationships. It's because they can't interpret information uh, the same way. And unfortunately, because I've been in the martial arts industry for 20-something years, I've seen this many, many times with, with guys, primarily, some, some ladies too, who have been punched in the, in, the, in the forehead too many times and their prefrontal cortex is damaged. Um, so I know I'm getting a little off topic, you guys, but if you missed any of this stuff, Baldo, I know you just came on, go back and watch this. I think your son would enjoy this just as well, just like the other video. This is really, really critical stuff. So we've been talking about recovery, sleep, strategic hustle, the fallacy of hustling, and, and how that can be detrimental to self-care. And, and now and I'm going to ask, uh, answer one more question here. So uh, Chris Kinser says, John, been following you for over 10 years now. Wow, that's cool. Uh, you're awesome. You're awesome. Thank you. 
I've got to join your penthouse group. I would love to have you join the penthouse group. If you guys are interested in doing it, we're going to have another one come up fairly soon. JohnSpencerEllis.com slash penthouse. JohnSpencerEllis.com. I forgot my own name. <laughs> JohnSpencerEllis.com slash penthouse. That's where I'm at right now. This is the penthouse. That's looking out towards the Palms Casinos, but you can't really see it right now. It's all blown out right now. That's the, the, it, it's very bright in here. I had to figure out the lighting here several different times. All right, so, so now that we talked about preparatory phase, self-care, recovery, um, using your brain properly, mindfulness versus mental toughness, if you missed any of that stuff, please go back and watch it because this is some good shit. And you, you, you're going to learn a lot and, and you're going to discover, you're like, here, here's what's most important to me, and I hope it will be important to you as well, is I bet, can you just show me some love and show me some hearts if you agree with this? Did you, was it interesting to you how all those different pieces actually fit together? Isn't that, and like, did you think, oh yeah, that's why that's that way, and that's that way, and, and I didn't even realize that all these pieces fit together, and now it makes sense. But can you can you indicate to me that that was insightful to you and that was uh, hopefully eye opening as well? Okay, so yeah, show me some love, baby. So uh, so here's now we're going to talk about the hustle. Um, what's important about hustling is that you need to do what's called hubu, highest use and best use of your time. Hubu, H U B U. What is the highest use and best use of your time? Some people would use the Pareto principle, which is 80-20. 20% uh, of your efforts will give you 80% of the results. 20% of your clients will give you 80% of your revenue. Uh, let me see, what's another one? 20% uh, of your exercises will give you 80% of the results. Uh, there's a lot of books. I'm trying to think of the guy's name who has a new book on the Pareto principle. Maybe someone can tell me. He's actually a marketer. I can't think of his name. He's been around for a long time. He's a legend in the industry, and I can't think of his darn name but uh it's like the it's like the 80 20 rule of everything it's a it's a blue book someone someone can list it below it's it's awesome i just can't think of the name of it so you always want to be in the highest use and best use of your time so you can hustle strategically so what you should ask yourself always is and, and you can literally set a re, you know there's apps on your phone you can set a reminder for anything you can just set a reminder that pings like every hour it says are you in hubu right I've conditioned myself now, I actually wouldn't mind getting an app and doing that, uh, but I ask myself constantly, sometimes aloud, you know, subconsciously and sometimes uh, externally, aud audibly, which I probably sound crazy and I don't care, um, there might be some truth to that. But I, I want to say, and I ask myself, are you in the highest use and best use of your time? Don't do something that is beneath your pay scale, do, don't do something that you can outsource, don't do something... That can be uh, something your kids can do, so you can focus on, on higher level skills. Don't, don't do something that wastes your time like that. Hey, Forrest Vance, how you doing? I know you are very efficient with the highest use and best use of your time. You're a smart dude. Um, so ask yourself that throughout the day. Am I in the highest use and best use of my time? Always. And if you're not, stop doing what you're doing. Stop it. Stop. Why would you do something that wastes your time or is below your skill set? or is lacking efficiency. That's why a lot of people major in minor things. You guys have heard that before, right? But then a year later, like, man, I didn't get anything done. I know why, because you're sitting spinning your wheels. It's kind of like if you wanted to enter a bike race and you're the only one on a stationary bike, but everyone else is going forward, but you're going twice as fast, but you're on a spin bike. Who's gonna go the furthest distance, right? So don't confuse effort with results. A lot of times people just want to be busy because it gives them an inaccurate sense of self-worth and productivity. So effort is always mandatory, uh, but it's the results that matter most. So it doesn't matter how much effort you're giving if the effort doesn't take you to the destination you desire, right? Forrest, hey John, great stuff here, thank you. Ah, um, you're welcome, man. I'm happy to, to do that. You know, I nerd out on this stuff. I love it. So how do you ensure that you're in the highest use and best use of your time? Here's, here's a simple way of doing it is uh, figure out what you're worth per hour. Okay. What are you worth per hour? And then figure out the minimum that you'd ever be willing to be paid to do a task. What is that minimum amount? $5, $10 an hour, $20 an hour. Some of you, it's $100 an hour. What is it? 
there's any task that can be outsourced for less than you're doing it, then outsource the task. There's lots of places uh, that can do physical work, technical work, administrative work, creative work. So if you're not good at something, just, you know what you need to know? You need to know you're not good at it, and you need to know enough to get someone who's better than you. That's what you need to know. I can't imagine if I tried to be as good at kinesiology, human movement, and biomechanics as my vice president, Scott Gaines. He's so frickin' smart. He's forgotten more about biomechanics, kines, arthrokinematics, and stuff like that than I ever learned. He's forgotten more than I've ever learned. And I've been doing fitness for, I don't know, 30 years. He's brilliant. Why would I spend my time trying to be as good as he is at that stuff? He's like, he nerds out on that stuff and he like eats it every day. He does like for breakfast. He loves it. I just need to know that he knows. And then I'm going to focus on what I'm able to do well. Hey, Chris, welcome. Welcome to the show. So we're talking about strategic hustling, recovery, sleep, uh, how to use critical thinking with the prefrontal cortex of your brain by analyzing things and responding with logic and critical thinking and deduction rather than bypassing the prefrontal cortex and going to the primitive brain and just re uh, reacting to something um, sometimes inappropriately and preemptively and you're not getting the desired result you want. So if you missed any of this, please go back to the beginning because there's a lot of really, really good stuff. Um, so here, here's what I want to talk about now. So there are times of the day which we talked about you know, sleep. You know, there's different... I, we didn't get into too much of the sleep science, but some of it uh, about the different levels of sleep, uh, uh, delta, theta, uh, waves, and things like that. We're not going to go into that today. Um, but when you are going through your day and you have tasks, there are times of the day when you are better at doing certain tasks than other times of the day. And everyone's a little bit different, but there are some general truths that are a common thread throughout humanity. And in general, here's how it goes. In the morning, you should do the things that require the highest degree of critical thinking uh, and uh, analytical uh, processing and things that are just more technically difficult. Why? Uh, because you uh, don't have clutter in your mind. Uh, you are hopefully properly fueled. Uh, with a, a, a proper breakfast, whatever that is for you, and a good night's sleep. Did you know that if you have a medical procedure, like a surgery, after 2 p.m., the likelihood of a uh, malpractice or malfeasance, some type of, of uh, medical mishap, goes up by like 28 or 38 percent? I forget exactly what it is. Someone can, can put that in the notes. It's insane. So basically, if you have a surgery, you, you almost double. I think it, was, it was actually higher than that. You almost double the likelihood of having an incident if you do it in the afternoon. I remember when I had uh, LASIK vision correction for my eyes. Now, that was 28 years ago, so my, eyes vision, my vision has regressed since then. But I, I knew this to be true even back then. And, and uh, I asked the doctor, I said, are you just as sharp in the afternoon as you are? In the heat? And he goes, it doesn't matter. And I'm like you're wrong, and I scheduled it for the first appointment. I had to wait an extra two weeks because I wanted it to be the first appointment in the morning because I knew there'd be less likelihood of an error. The same is true for you. So whatever, when you're hustling and you need to do something critical, technical, specific, uh, do it the first thing in the morning. You have fewer distractions, and there's less likelihood of any error. Uh, Chris, I'm going to answer your question in just one second. Then in the middle of the day, after lunch, there's a dip. You know, like that after lunch, wah, wah, you kind of dip down a little bit. That's the best time to do administrative tasks. If you have them, if you're not outsourcing them, is do administrative tasks. Because it's things that you know how to do, and it's just kind of uh, automatic. And you're just like, OK, I'm just going to do that. Yeah, OK, I'm going to move this here. And I go, OK, well, I'm just going to. That's administrative. Do that during the lull of the day, and, and then you're less, because it, it's things that are so mundane, so ritualistic that it doesn't require a high level of thinking. So do it during the dip. Then in the evening, people usually get a creative burst. So if you are a creative programmer, right, or if you are a musician, 
or if you're a writer, um, I'd be willing to bet that you do some of your best work later in the day. Is that true? So everyone's a little different, but those types of things tend to hold true. Now, why does all this matter? Because if you're doing it haphazardly, without intent, without direction, without critical thinking, you still may be busy and you still may be getting results, but it's not the way to maximize your results so you get the best results possible so you're happy with the outcome and you make further progress each day, each week, each month, each year, and then over a decade of time. So all these things matter. None of this, like, you guys, I've been studying and hanging out with and learning from the world's top achievers in sports, philanthropy, uh, technology, um, uh, art, all kinds of stuff for many, many years. And I hang out with them. I study them. I read their books. Um, and, you know, success leaves clues, right? I think that's an old Tony Robbins saying, but it's true. And so... If they keep doing the same thing and they're getting incredible results, but then there's tens or hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of people doing a certain something, there's something to it if they're all high achieving, right? And uh, you want to be within that culture. That's also why it's super important to hang out with smart people who are on the same path as you, but ideally ahead of you. Remember, you, it, I, the ideal thing is to be the dumbest person in the room and... Um, uh, that's a shame when you don't want to do that. You know what? I'm going to remind me about the dumbest person in the room thing here in a second. I'm going, to, I'm going to share a story with you in just one, one second that is really interesting. So hang on one second. Chris says, John, what are your thoughts on getting up early as a key to being successful? Everyone, uh, you know what? Uh, I disagree with that. Uh, Chris, sleep is more important. Um, people who think, this is interesting too, people who think that they are okay getting less sleep are 99% wrong. Here's why. So how many, you know, you, it may be you or someone you know thinks, oh, I'm one of those people who can get, uh, you know, six hours or less. I'm, I'm good. Here's the truth, not, not my belief. This is what science says. There's only 1% of the population that can get by on average, was less than seven to nine hours of sleep a night. Only 1% of the human population can get by with that. It's just due to chemistry, biology, uh, um, genes, and, you know, it's, it's, there's numerous factors, but only 1% of the population. But about half the people who get six hours or less say, yeah, I can get by on that. But here's the irony. This is what's funny. Because of the lack of sleep that they get, their ability to comprehend their recuperation is faltered by their lack of sleep. <laughs> so their belief that they're recovered having lack of sleep is actually, their ability to comprehend that is hindered by their lack of sleep. But they don't even realize it because they have lack of sleep. You get it? So only 1% of the human population can get seven or less hours on a regular basis and, and do poorly. Um, and it's, it's a ridiculous notion to think that people can get by on three, four, or five hours of sleep. You know what you call those people uh, in their 60s and 70s? Uh, cognitive, cognitively declined. You, uh, early onset Alzheimer's, dementia, uh, irritable, um, immune disorders, uh, gut health problems, uh, memory issues, relationship issues, all kinds of stuff because of lack of sleep. But sleeping more, remember we're talking about our strategic hustle, sleeping more is the single easiest thing you can do for human performance. Like everyone's looking for an edge, like I'm going to take nootropics, and, and which is fine, you know, that there's efficacy in, in some of those, not all of them. Um, and I'm going to do uh, uh, hormone replacement, which also can help. Um, or I'm going to do more caffeine because I need to be awake. Most people are not under caffeinated, they're underslept. And if you sleep more, especially after you have a huge learning experience or something experiential or educational or something profound, if you can sleep extra better, even more the night after, you're, you'll more easily retain that information and more readily move it from short-term to long-term memory and then later better be able to recover it for utilization and your benefit now and in the future. 
but everyone's like worried about, I'll just wake up and it's going to be caffeinated, right? Now, caffeine can definitely help. There's a whole bunch of studies that show that caffeine, especially if you uh, take caffeine before you take a test, on average, people who take caffeine as opposed to those who don't will test better. That's true. Uh, there's a bunch of data to support that. But that doesn't mean you sleep three hours because you had to cram for a test and then you just like have like five monsters. You're going to have a heart attack and you're going to suck at your test. That's what's going to happen. So prepare in advance because think about this too. Remember what we just talked about? Talking about hustling. If you need to learn something, you don't want to learn it in one night because it's, the next, it's that next night's sleep after you learn something that allows you to benefit. So what if you learn something repetitively, progressively, sequentially, over a period of many, many days, and then you had a good night's sleep after each of those, and then you keep reinforcing and improving and enhancing everything you learn because of the quality of sleep. And then when it came time to hustle, in this case maybe an exam or something you had to do that was really important, you have the ability to do that better because you slept better. So it's just really, really important to do that. So I'm going to go back to this mindset thing and uh, belief in yourself. We talked about self-efficacy a, a little bit ago. If you, and by the way, I know Preston, you just joined us. Please go back and, and watch this whole thing. I think I'm, I'm biased, but I think this is one of the best trainings I've done in a long time. I, I think this is some really, really important stuff. And if you missed any of it, please go back and watch. And if you're listening on iTunes or Stitcher later on audio, please go back and listen to the whole thing. Um, so, uh, let's see, last week, or no, maybe almost two weeks ago, I was at an event uh, in uh, Newport Beach, California, uh, put on by my buddy Vince Reed, and there were a lot of heavy hitters there. Uh, Jim Bunch, who has, is, is a very well-respected, well-known uh, entrepreneur, he worked with Tony Robbins for years, uh, Billy Jean, you guys know Billy Jean is marketing, Chris Record. Um, Caleb Maddox, he's only 16, but he's a self-made uh, millionaire. He told me he was going to buy his la dream Lamborghini this year while he's 16. And there was a bunch of people in this room that were just serious ballers. And this is a little cocktail get-together we had afterwards in one of the suites in the hotel. And it's always good to network, right? You want to hang out with people who are smarter than you. That's the goal. You want to be the dumbest person in the room. Ideally, ideally, you want to be the dumbest person in the room. But here's the story. And I'm going to change a couple of the details just to protect this guy's um, identity and, and so he has anonymity. But this is a true story, okay? So I, I met this gentleman uh, earlier at lunch. I went out to, hey, Larry, welcome. I, I went out to uh, lunch uh, with a couple friends and him. And, um, and this, this one gentleman, he went to the restroom real quick while, while you're having lunch. And while he was gone, and I said, I like your friend. He's super cool. And they said, yeah. He's homeless. He is sleeping in a storage container with his son. But I, I got him to this event because I believe in him, and he actually has an entrepreneurial spirit, but his spirit's been broken. And he's homeless, but he's living in a, uh, a storage unit. Storage unit, not a storage container, but like a storage unit. Uh, hey, Rhonda, with his son. And I don't know how old his son is. I'm guessing this, this guy is in his early 30s, maybe. So his son's fairly young. And, and he said, but I believe in him and I wanted to help him. Okay, hey, Dave. Um, so I learned this guy is homeless, living in a storage uh, shelter, a storage container, storage unit with his son. And then later that night, we're at this cocktail party with all these heavy hitters. And I said, I said, how you doing, man? You having a good time? And I mean, he, he asked me a lot of questions. He goes, so what's your advice for me? I'm an, uh, a new entrepreneur and all this kind of stuff. And I said, stay humble, keep learning, uh, hang out with the right people, uh, ignore people who don't love you and support you, and hang out with people who want to nurture and, and help you and guide you and who will, will love on you no matter what. He's like, all right, cool. And so he came to this party later, and he goes, these guys, is, he goes, who, who's here in this room? And I said, well... I said, uh, I said, you're going to be in some good company here. I said, see that guy over there? And he says, yeah. And I said, he's worth about $100 million. I said, this person you know, is on TV. This person's a millionaire. This person is a professional athlete. And I said, so it's great to be around these people because you're going to learn a lot. I mean, you have no choice but to learn and have fun, and they're all great. And he, he says, oh, man, he goes, I don't feel like I deserve to be here. And and I just put my arms around him. <laughs> and I said, 
I said, you know what? I said, I'm just going to give it to you straight here. I said, that is the most horrible thing you can ever tell yourself, that you don't deserve uh, to be there. It just, it just wasn't true. And I said, if I hadn't told you that these people you know, have $100 million or he's a professional athlete or this person drives a Lamborghini or whatever, I said, would you even know that? Would you have any idea? And he says, well, no. And I said, well, now that you know that, why does that matter? Um, and he says, well, I guess it doesn't. And I said, you can't tell yourself you don't deserve to be here because we all deserve to be here. And then I gave him the story and the understanding of that. It's important to be the dumbest person in the room. He says, well, I don't think I have a lot to add. And I said, you're a good guy. I said, I said you know, oh, here's what I told him. I said, uh, I said, you know why you deserve to be here? And he says, why? And I said, because you're not an asshole. <laughs> and I said, you see, the round, look around the room. I said, there's no assholes here. And he goes, you're right. Everyone's really nice. And I said, so you do deserve to be here because you're not an asshole. That's the criteria. It doesn't matter that you're homeless and live in a storage unit with your son. And it doesn't matter that he, this guy has $100 million and that person has a Lamborghini. None of that matters. If you're cool, you're in. And we're all here to help each other. And that's all that matters. So please, please, please uh, don't ever feel that you're not worthy of being somewhere or don't be concerned that you're not the most intelligent person in the room, that's a gift. That's a strategic advantage. That's one of the most important things that you can embrace is to uh, be around people who have more to offer than you. It's kind of like this. When I do my martial arts training, and I'm just gonna go, and I'll, I'll go back to this again, but you, a lot of you guys know I've been doing martial arts for I don't know, 20-something years, 25 years, I forget now. Um, and I've trained at a bunch of different schools, a bunch of different systems and styles. And um, I go to the toughest gyms that there are now. You know, my coaches are in the UFC. They retire from the UFC. They train UFC athletes. They're world champion kickboxers. They're judo champions. And I get punked because they're, they're awesome. They're, like, the best in the world. Like... I want to go where I'm the worst person because I know that everything I learn is going to be awesome. I know that if they're all better than me, I have no choice to, but to improve. There's, there's no option. So imagine if you go into a room and you're the smartest person. You can always learn something from anyone, even if you learn what not to do, and that's okay as well. But be okay being the person who knows the least. Now, if you're in a room where everyone may have a skill that you don't, but then they're all jerks, well, then you're just in the wrong room. Then sometimes just people are jerks. You just got to stay away from them. But if you're around the right kind of people and they're all better than you at whatever you want to excel at, or if they're all better than you in other things, uh, then that's important as well. And, and that brings me to another point, is that oftentimes people are on a mission and they only want to learn from people that have certain skill sets or, or are only in their industry. And so that happens a lot because, again, I work with a lot of people in the fitness industry and they only want to learn things from people in the fitness industry. But some of the most important lessons I've learned are from people in completely different industries. Uh, my buddy Sean owns Club Tattoo, uh, which has numerous locations here in Las Vegas and also some in Arizona. Um, he does... Eight figures plus a year. Yeah, eight figures doing tattoo. So do the math. Seven figures is a million. So he's doing eight plus a year with a tattoo business. I learn a lot from him. By the way, if you want to read his book, it's called Tattooed Millionaire. The Tattooed Millionaire. Buy his book. It's brilliant. Brilliant. Um, he actually used to um, be in a band with the guys from Lincoln Park, too. So he's a, he's a really cool guy and he's got great stories. So be willing to be the dumbest person in the room. But if people are not kind to you, then just change the room. But don't change your desire to be the dumbest person in the room. I strive to be the least knowledgeable in the room, and not by dumbing myself down, but by elevating the circle of people that I'm with. And, and here's the truth, you guys. Sometimes you have to pay to be in that room. Not every room like that is free. And, and why is it important to pay? Because the more you pay, the more you pay attention. The more you pay, the more you pay attention. And it goes for anything. Some of you have just raised your rates for some of your services you're providing. Um, have you noticed people pay attention more because they're paying more? And, and have you ever gotten something for free and then never used it? 
or forgot where it was or you lost it because you got it for free. But what if you, but what if it had equal value, you know, let's just say it was $500 or whatever, but you had to pay that 500, you had to earn that 500, then you had to give up that 500 to get it. You pay more attention. So the more you pay, the more you pay attention. That always holds true. So um, I'm going to wrap this thing up here, you guys. I know some of you just joined us. Please, 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 please go back to the beginning. I am biased, and I also think that this is one of my best trainings I've done in a very, very long time. It's about how to hustle smart, how to strategically hustle, how to do the proper work-rest cycle for strategic. It's about using the highest and best use of your time. It's about knowing what hour of the day is best to do each type of task so you can optimize your human performance every day so you can get more done every single day and have an incredible sense of accomplishment. And remember what Bill Gates said, which I think is super important, and I'm going to paraphrase because I can't remember exactly what it was, but he said something to the effect of uh, people overestimate what they can do in a year but underestimate what they can do in a decade. I actually think that's right. So people, this is a, that's a Bill Gates. People underestimate, I'm sorry, they overestimate, overestimate what they can do in a year and underestimate what they can do in a decade. So stay the course over time. Jumping around too much gives you a bunch of little things that don't always cohesively fit together or build upon an existing foundation. But if you can build upon the foundation and then have your foundation become strong through those restorative, recuperative practices we talked about earlier, then your foundation keeps growing and becoming more profound to give you the basis to continue to escalate and elevate your game so you can do more, accomplish more, be more, share more, love more, experience more, travel more. Yeah, baby. That's it. I hope this was helpful for you guys. Um, as I said earlier, I'm going to the Share concert tonight. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to hand over my man card <laughs> at the door. Oh, my gosh. I am probably going to be one of the only uh, heterosexual dudes at, at the share concert. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> but I welcome everyone. I love everyone. Doesn't matter, but I'm just stating it's probably true. All right. That's it, you guys. Uh, Lisa, please listen to all this. I know you just joined. Um, thank you so much. Thank you guys for all your comments, support, love. Uh, please do me a favor. Will you share this? Uh, hit the share and just share it with all your friends. Will you please, please do that? Because I think this can help anyone and everyone, no matter who you are, as long as you want to accomplish more, I promise you. So please, please, please listen to this from the beginning. If you missed anything, uh, click the share button and then write a little note on your, on your blog or your Facebook wall so they know what this is about and, and how you think it will benefit them. And please do that and share this for me. Okay. Peace out. You guys have a good day. Okay. I'll see you later.